Kiss 92, all the great songs in one place. It's Glenn, Angel, and Daphne. Coming we to you live. are at Lone Pine Koala Sanctuary right here in Brisbane. It is such a beautiful day, as you can see. It's clear skies. Uh, we're just along the Brisbane River, and, and it is absolutely beautiful. We're very, very excited because this is the largest and the oldest koala sanctuary in the entire world. That's right. It's imagine? gorgeous. It's gorgeous. It's like these two thing. ladies who are here with me. Oh, thank Aww, you. Thanks, You're not Glenn. too bad yourself, Glenn. <laughs> <Thank you. laughs> All right, we're gonna be we're gonna be welcoming uh, a ranger later on. Her name is Maddie. She's gonna be talking a little bit about koalas. Uh, we're also going to be having some animals on the show. We've got a sheepdog. We've got a dingo, and we're either gonna have a monitor lizard or a snake. Oh, we I'm have, looking forward to that. So am I. The I snake love and rep- the mon- is it? I want it to like, you know, slither all over me. I'm going to switch places I'll, with you guys. Just, I want to play with the dingo. That's I'll just oh, okay. Cl- we'll clear these two tables and oh, then just I'll just lie oh, okay. this way and you just let oh. them, you know. Crawl over you. Come on me. <laughs> <laughs> it's very, very, very exciting. Of course, we're going to be showing you some videos as well um, of what we did uh, yesterday. So let's play the first video. This is shopping a shopping spree along James Street that I did. So James Street uh, is an absolutely gorgeous spot. Uh, I went shopping with the ladies of Spree with me. There was Imogene and there was uh, Celia. This first shop that we went to was called Dinosaur Designs. Now, it started in 1985 by Louise and Ormandi. Now, uh, all of uh, Dinosaur Designs objects that you see on the screen now are made of resin. So they have jewelry they have homeware uh, they have all sorts of objects like you see they, they they make tables out of the resin the resin is actually developed from a byproduct of the oil industry and it actually has an expiry date if it's unprocessed it is essentially a waste product so what they're actually doing is being very sustainable and turning them into beautiful objects look at that i mean the wow. colors the pink of the bowl was the pink of my nail polish i mean it, it is also our kiss pink they've got some beautiful salad bowls uh, salad servers vases so nice they're, they're absolutely gorgeous and they're very solid now uh, they design and hand make every piece using low energy methods from a product derived from a waste material and their resins are BPA free and suitable for cold food service so you don't want to be heating these up uh, then we moved on to a store by Gail Saronda now Gail is a graduate of Queensland University of Technology uh, she actually won the Mercedes-Benz startup award while she was graduating graduating uh, with a collection wow. called Angel at My Table. Oh, now the that's prize, why you were there. That's why I was there. The prize for, for that was a chance to show at the Australian Fashion Week in 2005. And she hit her stride early because Karl Lagerfeld called her uh, the, the designer to watch in Harper's Bazaar UK. Wow. And in 2010, she was also selected by Dolce & Gabbana to wholesale 30 of her pieces for a pop-up in their boutique on Via della Spiga uh, in Milan. So it's she's she's got some amazing stuff, uh, very darkly romantic gowns, Victoria-style blouses. They're all Gothic-inspired. Uh, she draws inspiration from a dark and light yin and yang, as you can see. Mm-hmm. Uh, I tried on some of her pieces. Uh, so, some, I would say her pieces would be something I would wear uh, on front row of a fashion week, mm-hmm. you know. Very um, I saw some of the uh, outfits you were in so beautiful on our IG reels. That's right, yeah. So if you want to view more, you can view them on Instagram. It's kiss92fm. And her stuff is beautiful because it can be layered. So obviously she's wearing her own designs. <gasps> that's uh, her. She was in the store. That, that's her. That's her, yeah. <gasps> and I here Which I one? am with a, the, that lady? the lady in the black lady. skirt. Yeah. Oh. So here I am in a shirt dress with a very flowy sort of chiffon uh, sleeve. Oh, and love then this look. she layered on top sort of a tunic which can be shaped and it'll shape the dress as well. Massive collars. Obviously I was wearing my wrong the wrong shoes i was in timberland so <laughs> i mean i would have brought a pair of like well she's black in a boots. doc mart she uh, not quite doc marts but <laughs> similar yeah <laughs> Uh, the next stop we had was uh, was Age. This is a boutique called Age, A-J-E. It was founded in 2008 by best friends Adrian Norris and Edwina Forrest. Now, this is a contemporary Australian fashion brand dedicated to raw beauty, tough femininity, and effortless cool. Now, I absolutely love this store. because very you. It's very me, right? <laughs> yeah, very everyday pieces. I tried that dress on uh, in the middle as well. Uh, you'll see some of the pieces that I tried on. Uh, they are 
pioneers of Australia's quintessential coastal to urban style. Uh, they have a signature style of curated mix of effortless essentials, statement occasion pieces, each one crafted with uh, luxurious sensibilities. So they're all very, very wearable. Uh, you'll see me trying I on some I saw you of these. in the pink dress. The pink dress, Beautiful. yeah. You'll see it in a, in a couple of seconds. Uh, that was Libby that helped me out with all the pieces. It's a nice um, suit Libby's uh, she, you're right, the wearing. Top, yeah, yeah, the pink. And they, they have everything from bags to jewelry to shoes. Uh, really, All the accessories. All the ac accessories. That's why she went shopping on her own. Right? I mean, she didn't I, need us. You guys were going to cramp my style. And, you know, I don't waste time when I go shopping. So, <gasps> look at that. That's a pink oh, dress. Lady uh, in red. No, this is pink. It was a shocking pink. I know the camera isn't quite showing it, but it was a shocking pink. That's not pink. It is pink. It's pink. It's, pink. Okay. it's, pink. You you say so. it's like a real. fuscia. And this was a, the uh, a top and uh, shorts uh, piece, which you obviously you can wear with other pieces you can I mix them I love the off shoulder as well on you the mm. pants were very very nice yeah so thank you to all the boutiques for that shopping spree and of course the spree with me <laughs> there you go <laughs> meanwhile, meanwhile <laughs> we were having a great time I bought Daphne like some ice cream and then we came across City Winery amazing and I mean, they opened just for us they yes. were actually about to you know leave for the day and they yeah. were like oh you want to come in and taste some wine? That's sure. Dave, right? So kind. Yeah. So uh, Dave's from Tasmania. Okay. Well, yeah. All right. And he started uh, winemaking in Tasmania. And uh, he's moved to Brisbane with his uh, wife. Mm. His wife is an artist. And, uh, you know, someone who knows all about wine as well. So together, they are the perfect couple. The I perfect love... perfect winemaking couple. And you know what I love is that his wife makes the artwork which forms on every label that, yeah. oh, that wow. is for each bottle of wine that oh, they, you know, nice. for the different types of wine. And he had some crazy stories about the wine. So this is the tasting of the Shiraz. One of the best Shirazes I've, I've ever incredible. had. Wine out of a barrel. Mm. Wow. That must have been a first for both of you, right? I no, said the no, first, no. no. You've, you've had wine of a barrel like yes. that before? And Daphne? First for me, and the body of it. I don't know if it's because it was straight out of the barrel, but the body of the Shiraz was amazing. Yeah, it was so good. See, I was Such like... Such a um, good spot. I was licking the bottom of that of uh, course, you, you, wine glass. That's how long my tongue is. Oh, Glenn, Glenn <laughs> you're like a giraffe. Another, Glenn needed another uh, glass. refill because he drank it before we took photos. <laughs> I must have had like five glasses. I think we, we tried a quite a few. I Thanks. absolutely love James Street. I mean, they, they showcase all Australian labels. Yeah. Uh, if you're ever in Brisbane, please make a trip down to James Street. And don't forget to stop by the Carlisle Hotel as well, which is an iconic heart of, the, heart of, uh, of James Street. You yeah. have to stop there. And, and if you're hungry, Stop mm. by Harvey's. Absolutely. Oh Harvey's was absolutely wonderful. Look uh, for my good friend PJ. <laughs> PJ morning, is chef PJ. owner, yes. It, uh, we did have a beautiful spread of seafood. Yep. Uh, there was a their very famous chicken salad as well. Mm -hmm. uh, there was the gnocchi with scallops. Which Not a salad guy. Gnocchi with scallops. That's, gnocchi that's, with scallops. That was my favorite. I had the roasted pumpkin with avocado and the couscous and kale, which was beautiful. And he's well known for his fish. So the barramundi or the market fish of the day, which, is, which was barramundi last night, was absolutely amazing. You can tell that he's so passionate about mm -hmm. cooking and, and, you know, creating that vibe but also very thoughtful plating and and texture and flavor which was so well put together and, and remember um singapore if you come over to uh james street precinct and you go to harvey's ask for the glen soto <laughs> the glen, the glen soto? soto which is a slightly spicier version of their very famous prawn risotto okay if, yeah pj's agreed to it no okay yeah. all right just ask for the glen zotto <laughs> and you'll have a much spicier version so if you want to see photos of the food uh, that we had last night we're going to be showing it at the end of the big show tv so you'll just have to wait throughout the hour watch uh, watch all the fun that we're going to be having on the big show tv and then you can see all the photos uh, of the of the meal that we had last night mm, very good nice. okay yes let's have our first guest on we right have now. Maddie. Ranger Maddie. It's not on it's yet. Not on. Can we get her mic on? Good morning. Good morning. Uh, a bit more. How's that? Yeah, uh, I think we need it. Oh. Can we try that again? How's that? Oh, perfect. Better? Yeah, awesome. <laughs> Yeah, lower it there. A bit loud. Yeah. Okay. Good morning. <laughs> morning. Good morning, Maddie. So lovely seeing you. you. Um, so we're going to be talking about the koalas today. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> we'll talk a little bit about it now, and then in about five minutes, okay. uh, we will 
is. We will go, go on, on air, air once yeah. again. So we no might worries. just ask you uh, a the few of the question. same questions. Yeah, that's yeah. fine. <laughs> so how long have you been a koala keeper here at Lampine? Uh, so here at Lampine, I've been here about two years, a bit over two years. Uh, so I started um, just doing uh, studies at uni um, about on animals. So I studied zoology and animal science. Um, and I had a love for koalas right back then. So then what better place to work than Lone Pine, which is the biggest koala sanctuary in the world. So, And yeah. how old is Lone Pine? So Lone Pine was built back in 1927. Wow. Yeah. Okay. yeah, wow. So in that same year, koalas became a protected species, which is pretty cool. Um, and Claude Reed started the sanctuary. And how many yeah. koalas are there in the wild, would you say? So they don't know exact numbers. Mm. Um, they are listed as endangered um, as of 2022 up here in Queensland. Uh, but yeah, they um, estimates have been made at around 80,000. Since then, we've had bushfires and whatnot. So oh. they don't know exact numbers. Yeah. Yeah. I remember the, the awful bushfires you guys had a couple of years yeah, ago with, yeah. the, with the images of the koalas yeah. and stuff. That was oh, so man. sad. Yeah. yeah, it was. It was. What's a typical day um, like for you? Uh, well, my days can look very different depending on what I'm doing here. So I also collect uh, eucalyptus leaves to feed our colony. So some days I start at 5 a.m. and I go out with one other person and we collect around half a ton of eucalyptus branches and we bring them back and that happens every single day. How do you collect them? Uh, In bins? Yeah, so we take them out, we take a trailer out and um, we harvest from our sustainably from our trees. Uh, we bring them back and then we sort them through um, the different enclosures. And then when I'm in the park, though, I do a mixture of cleaning, feeding, health checking, um, and interacting with the public with our beautiful koalas. So when you say collect eucalyptus leaves, where exactly are you going to collect so these leaves? So we own three different plantations here okay. at uh, Lone Pine. So we go to one of those different plantations, um, and we can collect from a variety of different species so that the koalas have some variety. We at least bring back four or five different species every single day. And we are, yeah, chopping down with bow saws or chainsaws, um, harvesting from these trees. And we do so sustainably so we can collect from a singular tree uh, a few times a year, which is oh, pretty right, cool. Okay. Yeah. If I can ask, do you know why Lone Park was opened? Yeah, so Claude Reed was um, worried about the koalas numbers declining because they were part of the fur trade. Um, mm. So thousands of koalas were killed and harvested for their fur. Um, and he knew the numbers were declining. So he started as a sanctuary with just two koalas. And since then, we now have around 100 koalas that we maintain at every single Well year. done. Yeah. Amazing. Well, what would you say is the biggest threat uh, to koalas? Like, who are their predators? Uh, we are. <laughs> okay. So, oh, habitat are, we, are they still being Okay, are they still being hunted? No, no, no. no okay. Not since 1927. It became illegal to hunt koalas. Mm. Um, but we are taking their habitats. So, habitat destruction is a big thing for them, which affects them directly through actually taking their habitat and indirectly through meaning that they're pushed together, which means diseases spread more. They're now mm. closer to roads. They're getting hit by cars. They're closer right. to our dogs. Our dogs have a big effect on them too um, mm. through dog attacks. So, yeah, we affect them in many different oh, ways. Oh, dog attacks. Yeah, mm. yeah, dog attacks is, is a common? big one. Yeah, yeah so. Because they're, they're both encroaching on each other. I mean, well, we're encroaching on their territory and the koalas have nowhere else to go, yeah, right? Yeah, I was going to say, exactly because right. koalas look like soft toys, so all the dogs are like, toys. <laughs> um, yeah, because koalas are safe when they're living up there in their trees. Yeah. But when they come down to cross from tree to tree, uh, unfortunately, easy Take target it, for yeah. a dog to get. Um, so, yeah, big thing about teaching dogs um, to stay away as well mm. as keeping dogs on leads when walking in those sort of koala mm. habitat areas. Yeah. Okay, okay, we're going on air. All right. No worries. So, so we, we go. might repeat some of the questions. Yeah, that's fine. Sounding amazing. Oh, thank you. <laughs> G'day and welcome to the big show live from Down Under. You'd be hopping mad to miss it. Kiss 92, all the great songs in one place. It's Glenn, Angel, and Daphne, and we are so very happy to be here at Lone Pine Koala Sanctuary, which is an 18-hectare koala sanctuary in the Brisbane suburb of Fig Tree Pocket. And 
was founded back in 1927. It is the first, oldest, and largest koala sanctuary of its kind in the world. And our first guest for today is Ranger Maddie. Good morning, Maddie. Good morning, guys. Good morning. We're so privileged to have you here with us. Now, Maddie, you're known as a koala keeper. Yes, can, that is correct. Can you tell us how long you've been a koala keeper and why you decided on this job? So I've been a koala keeper here at Lone Pine for about two years now. Uh, my love for koalas started back when I was a kid. I didn't always live here in Brisbane. I lived down in New South Wales. So down there, I grew up around the sounds of koalas and I saw koalas quite frequently on my property. Um, so my love started back there. And then when I was old enough to volunteer, I volunteered at a koala hospital back in Lismore. And I spent about a year there, um, working there every Wednesday, helping the sick koalas that we had in Lismore area. And then I went to uni and I got some degrees and then I came here. What better place to come than the largest koala sanctuary of the world? And I started working here with the koalas. Amazing. And it's almost a century old, right? Yeah, that is time. correct. Yeah. Um, why did it open? And so, who, did it, who, who opened it? So Claude Reed um, opened it back in 1927. And that's because koalas back then were hunted for their fur. So 1927, they became a protected species, thank God. So they were no longer hunted, but their numbers had plummeted due to that. So then Claude Reed opened Lone Pine as a sanctuary for all sick and injured animals. And he started with just two koalas and he named them Jack and Jill. Oh, oh. yeah. <laughs> what, what, are the, what, are the, uh, what is the lifespan of a koala? So out in the wild, lifespan's typically about eight to 10 years. But when they live here with us at Lone Pine, it's about 12 to 15 years. So they live a bit longer. Yeah. Okay. Okay. And, and what? Yeah. And how much do they? Uh, how much rest do they need? <laughs> so they're sleeping and resting about eighteen to twenty hours a day, which is huge. Good life. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, so they're waking and they're sleeping and they wake up to eat and they'll go back to sleep. But typically, dawn and dusk is when they're most active. Naturally. Ooh, I like that. Yeah. Dawn I mean, they're dusk. very protected. So do they have working hours here? Yes, they sure do. We're lucky enough to be able to bring our koalas out and interact with our guests. Mm -hmm. um, but to be able to do so, we can only bring them out a maximum of 30 minutes a day and a maximum of three days in a row. But like I said, that's maximum. If they want to work less than that that particular day, they don't have to. It's a three oh, day nice, work week. Nice yeah. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. Right. And, and only awake dawn and dusk. I yeah. quite like the way yeah, they... Yeah, so they can wake in the middle of the day. We mm. feed our koalas here middle of the day. So they'll all wake up, they'll have a big um, stomach full of food and then they go back to sleep. Oh, I love it. Yeah. I love it. Uh, what would you say is the biggest threat uh, for koalas? So one of the biggest... One of the biggest threats here um, is habitat destruction. So unfortunately, that is caused by us. So we um, are clearing their habitat, which directly affects them. They have less places to live. Um, and in doing so, they are becoming crowded together and they're coming into our areas where we live. So where we live, we build roads and we have cars. And unfortunately, koalas can be affected by that. And car strikes is a big one, um, as well as dog attacks, because everyone has their pet dogs and... Uh, running koala past is often something fun for a dog to chase and mm. dog attacks is a big one for them as well. Oh, we can. Tra I'm sure the dogs can be trained to kind of yeah, stay away yeah, from the koalas, right? Yeah, dogs can be um, trained as well as kept indoors at night because um, mm. koalas are coming down to the ground, um, coming along the ground, so dogs on a lead or and dogs lead, contained. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. okay. okay. Uh, we've, we've been talking to Ranger Maddie and, you know, earlier on, Angel actually went into the koala sanctuary um, to meet a very special koala. We've got highlights of that right now. I'm here at Koala Keeper, Holly, and Holly, thanks so much for being here. Can you introduce us to who this is? This is one of our lovely boys, and his name is Merlin. How old is Merlin? Merlin is eight years old, turning nine this year. Okay, now I hear that um, koalas in Australia, there's a regulation that they can only work a certain amount of hours a day. So what are their working hours? Um, it's only 30 minutes a day, and it can uh, be no more than three days in a row. Oh, wow, okay. Yeah. So they're very, very protected and very taken care of. Yeah, absolutely. We want this to always be a positive experience for them. And in the wild, what are, who are their predators? Um, it can be dingoes, some large pythons and raptors, goannas. Uh, they don't have a large range of predators. They're not like the main food source for their predators. Um, but their number one killer is actually household dogs. Oh, really? Yeah. Wow. Are they, are they, are they um, at risk of being endangered? 
Um, so they actually are listed as endangered okay. um, due to deforestation and the removal of trees because they do only eat eucalyptus. Um, so removing their trees is removing their home and their food. Oh, wow. Are there any misconceptions about koalas? Uh, yeah, the biggest one is actually the effect eucalyptus has on them. Which is uh, what? I mean, like, what, what do people say about that? Uh, that it has more of like a drug effect, makes them high. Okay. Um, but it actually just has such a low energy content that they just sleep all the day because they have to conserve the energy for when they need it. So are they nocturnal or daytime animals? Um, they're actually more crepuscular, so dusk and dawn. Dusk and dawn, yeah. I like that. Hi, Merlin. <laughs> Am I allowed to touch Merlin? Absolutely. We just want to make sure we just give him a pat on the lower part of his back. So, so you will have to reach slightly through the leaves. Through the leaves? Yeah. By promise and it won't sweet. scratch me, will it? No. If you listen to everything I say, you'll be absolutely fine. He's a sweet boy. <laughs> Hi, Merlin. Oh my gosh. How pretty are you? Do you want some of this? Oh my gosh. How much, how much do they eat all day? Um, it's around 600 to 700 grams. So grams, okay. Lot, if you think about how light a leaf is. But if you leave them in a eucalyptus tree, are they just going to continuously eat? No, so they're actually are very picky eaters. Okay. So they'll only eat a small proportion of species. And even then, they prefer the tip of the plant, the regrowth. So the nice light green stuff that has the most nutrients, easiest to digest, and also the most water. Um, so when they're in a big tree, they actually won't eat the mature leaves unless it's a s very small number of species they'll actually eat the mature leaf. Okay. Thank you so much, Holly. Thank good. you, Merlin. I don't want to stop touching <laughs> you, though. How soft was uh, oh, Merlin's like, fur? I mean, like, like, like a stuffed toy, you know what I mean? Oh. Uh, uh, it was it was so beautiful to get so close. You're so lucky yes. to be able to work yeah. with Your these. Job. Yeah, I love it. <laughs> Betty, are there koalas all over Australia? Yeah, I was going to no, ask. No, so there's not. They're mainly along the east coast of Australia. So up in this section here and right down into Victoria along the east coast. Mm. Um, and if you look at our koalas here, our koalas are northern koalas. If you look at a koala down um, Victoria Way, you have southern koalas. Um, and they look a bit different. So they're a lot browner, they're bigger, they're fluffier. So yeah, Merlin looks a little bit different to his friends down there. Do okay. people keep koalas as pets? No, it's not legal to. It's not legal, but do they? No. Okay. <laughs> Good. Supposed to not have. <laughs> yeah. But like what Maddie was saying, she grew up with uh, koalas in in, in you New know, South in Wales. The surrounding. Said, right? Yeah, right? yeah. Is that there? Is that? In the Originally, where they're, where they're from? Yeah, they so are they? Um, I lived uh, on the East Coast, okay. uh, far north coast, and koalas are very, very prominent around there um, mm. when I was growing up. Yeah. yeah. And Can still there, when I still go home, them? I still get to see them in the wild trees yeah. as well. Do you, did you have any encounters with them as a child? Yeah, like up close? I sure did. Um, so that's how I knew about the koala hospital because um, we had rescued probably three all up over my years growing up, um, and we took them to the koala hospital there. Oh, wow. That's yeah. where you volunteered, right? Yeah, yeah. Amazing. Amazing. So they're mostly in, in trees, but yeah. they do come down yeah, once so in a while. Yeah, so they can come down to, from the tops of the trees uh, to either find another tree to eat or to find a mate. Yeah, because they don't jump across trees, so they have to come all the way down yeah, to climb Yeah, they come down up. to the ground, we'll walk along the ground and then right. back up. But back that's up, where right? the danger lies when they yeah. come down. Yeah, exactly mm -hmm. right. Okay. Uh, how long more do we have? We have about two minutes. Okay. How heavy do they get, like these so ones? So the Northern Koala, like Merlin that you met, would weigh around eight, eight and a half kilos on okay. average for a male. The ladies are about five, five and a half. Um, but down in southern parts, they get to about 15 kilos. Ooh, whoa, being okay. males. Big. Yeah. <laughs> and so they're like small to medium dogs. Yeah, 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 small to medium, yeah, Cause, yeah. Because my boy, my Jack Russell Terrier, is 8 kilograms. And my Golden Retriever is 30 now. So, I mean, he's considered <laughs> three, a big dog, zero. right? 3-0? Three, three, zero. Zero. Yeah, yeah. Oh, my goodness. Yeah, well, Tofu. he is a big dog, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and um, how, at what age are they fully grown? So, um, we have a variety of ages here at Lone Pine. Um, so, they can be sexually mature when they're quite young. Mm. Um, so, they can physically reproduce at about that 18 mark month old oh, wow, okay. which is not what they should be doing <laughs> they, um, at around three years old mm. they're fully grown um they're sexually mature and they can mate yeah, yeah mm. and they are marsupials right that is correct they have a pouch they have a pouch yeah, yeah. I, I didn't know yeah. that yeah what? and they're and their babies are called joeys 
Yeah. Oh, anything okay. you can put in a pouch is called a joey, right? Yeah, marsupial babies are marsupial joey. Marsupial babies yeah. are joey, right? I didn't know that. And yeah. how long do the babies stay in the pouch? So koalas are pretty cool. They actually have jelly bean babies. Yes, I've seen so the pictures. They, yeah, they're about this big when they're first born and they make a really long journey from mum's cloaca up and into mum's pouch by themselves. Oh so they have these big that's... forearms that they climb all the way up into mum's pouch. Right. Um, and they'll stay there for about six months. So oh, they, oh, we won't see them for uh, that that's first what six That's what I'm YouTubing. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and how many babies do they have at a go? Uh, just one. Just one, okay. Yeah. And Twins is possible, very, very uncommon. Wow. Yeah. And the gestation period? So 33 to 35 days that's after it. a mating. Wow. Yeah, because they come out oh. just very small little oh. things. So six months in the pouch, and then they come out looking a bit more like a koala. Um, yeah. And then they'll stay with mum for another six months. <gasps> yeah. They must be so cute. Yeah, what I, I've seen a TikTok video. Yeah, no, I've so seen, yeah. I've seen videos old, of they them. They come out of the pouch. Yeah, and Jelly they'll come in and out of mum's pouch, still drinking milk. And then by about eight months old, they become back young. And then they just hang out on mum's back. Right. And, yeah. and when do they start getting their fur? Okay, wait, hold on. We're going on air. No, wait. Kiss night to all the great songs in one place. It's Glenn Angel and Daphne coming to you live from Brisbane right now. We are at Lone Pine Koala Sanctuary and we've been speaking to Ranger Maddie. We hope you've been watching us on the Big Show TV. It's good been morning, so Maddie, good, once again. Good morning, morning Maddie. <laughs> Sorry about that. Uh, it's been so much fun talking to you and finding out a little bit more about koalas. I mean, as much as they look like stuffed toys, uh, can you tell us what people can do in their day-to-day -day lives to help protect koalas? No worries. It's been my pleasure talking to you guys about koalas. Um, so day-to-day -day lives will depend if you're living around koalas or not. Um, if you are luckily enough to live in an area where koalas live, you can always um, stick to speed limits. There will be signs posted in areas that have koalas frequently on the ground. Um, and dawn and dusk is when they're most active, so really be careful around those times. You can keep your dogs indoors at night as well, um, as well as um, if you do come across a sick or an injured koala or any other wildlife for that matter, um, 1300 animal is a number that can be called. But if you're not um, locally living around koalas, uh, purchase sustainably sourced uh, paper materials so that you're not adding to any deforestation or habitat destruction that may affect animals out there right. in the wild. Okay, yeah. I'm quite sure if you're listening to us right now in Singapore from the Bado or Tuapayo or Orchard <laughs> area, there are no koalas yes. there. <laughs> um, but for the benefit of people who don't quite know, uh, can you find koalas throughout Australia? No, unfortunately not. They're only along the, sea, uh, the east coast of Australia. But you know, I mean, what she did say was interesting because a lot of uh, Singaporeans who travel to Australia also rent cars. Mm. So if you do come across any signs that mm. say it's a koala area, you want to slow down, uh, this number 1300 animal is also handy to have yeah, for tourists way, as well. Yeah, they can get the help that they need, those and animals. This might be a silly question, but there's no koalas outside of Australia, I'm guessing. Not <laughs> wild koalas, Not no. Not wild, okay, okay, fair. <laughs> Zoo koalas, yes. maybe. Oh, my. Any fun facts, Maddie, that you can uh, provide us about koalas since, oh. you, since they're part of your life? Yeah, there's so many I could name, but I think <laughs> one really cool thing is they actually have fingerprints like we do, and they're really hard to distinguish between a koala and a human fingerprint. So oh. that's really nifty, yeah. Wow. Okay. Well, they've got really long nails, nails. or Very claws. sharp claws. Helps to climb all those trees that oh. they climb. Right. Yeah. <laughs> so they don't bite, do they? Uh, anything with teeth has the potential to yeah. bite. Mm. But our guys here, they've been growing up around us. They're very used to us here. So what would make them, um, like, you bite. know, bite someone Agitated, or scratch right, someone? Yeah. Um, we respond their personal boundaries. Um, and we can read them if they're giving us signs saying we, they're not liking what we're doing. Um, we obviously won't push that boundary. And to that point, you know, because I was asking before that they all have their own kind of personality. Yeah, yeah, which is really cool. Yeah, <laughs> what is like an attribute that displays a personality in a koala? Because, you know, for dogs, it's like if they are licking their nose or they're yawning, they're uncomfortable and stuff. So what are... Some, some attributes to koalas that will show off their personality. Yeah, no worries. Um, sometimes if they're disturbed by a certain sound that's happening, um, they can have quite an upright posture, ears forward and looking towards a sound that they're not comfortable with. Um, but yeah, it just depends on the koala. They're all very different. Yeah. Okay. Well, thank you so much, uh, Maddie, for welcome. talking to us. My pleasure.
It's been so much fun. It is 8.15. 92 Time Check brought to you by Putin. Thank you. Thank Maddie. you so Thank much. You so much Thank you for having me, guys. <laughs> We're going to wait for our next guest to come on in. Is this when I switch seats? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> I, I think Daphne is a little bit uh, hesitant to be next to uh, whatever is coming next. Well, um, the handsome boy is coming yeah, next. Yeah, we've got a handsome little boy coming. How can you be afraid oh, of that? Uh, wait, hold on. It's a, no, it's a female. This is the sheepdog. Is this a sheepdog? No. What? It's not a sheepdog. Is it a dingo? No, it's it's a sheep dog. dog. Oh! Sheep dog. Yeah, yeah. Wow. I'm so happy. Hello. Um. All right, just a little bit of a switcheroo. Uh, you have to get your foot. You, have to get so you, okay, with, you well. okay with dogs, yeah. right? Yeah, yeah but yeah, later on, the All right, we're gonna meet. Um, we're gonna meet yeah, Flirt. <laughs> She's a female Kelpie. What's her name? Flirt. 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 Like you. Yeah. Whoa, 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 whoa. Hey. That's my middle name, not my first name. Thanks a lot, ladies. Okay. And there you go. Um, has Flirt's handler we is are switched. Um, Aeon. Ready for the animal. Yes, I'm ready. Yes, I'm ready. Thank you, <laughs> Shalini. I'm ready. <laughs> so many things to remember. Oh. I'm not ready apparently. Hello. Here we go. Are you Aeon? Hi, Aeon. Aeon. Yeah. You're over here next to me. She looks very young. Uh, she's seven, turning eight this year. Oh. Okay, not that young. Hi, <laughs> nice to meet age. you. Hello, Flirt. Come here. Oh, you can't really see her. Hello, sweetheart. Can you jump up? You can very jump up. Fit, Come on. Yeah, let her get in your lap. Oh. Oh, look at her. She's a little bit camera shy. Okay, let's pull your legs up. And she's seven, you say? Yeah, so she's turning eight. Oh, sorry, here, you need a microphone. Yeah. You can move forward if it's possible. I'll help you with it. One, two, three. Okay. Oh, yeah. Hi, That's baby. All right. Hi, Hi, baby. Hello. Oh, hi. Okay, hi. Now I'll be regret my seat swap. <laughs> so, um, Flirt is, what kind of dog is she? So, she's a Kelpie. Okay. So, Flirt here is our Kelpie. She's seven years old. Um, she's been working with our sheep. Uh, for yeah, since she was two, so we got her when she was fully trained, and then we just keep on working on the training every single day. Wow, uh, you got such a big job, huh? Yeah. Our most Kelpies sheep dogs, or I'm uh, uh, sorry, a, a specific type of breed, usually sheep dogs. So. so here in Australia, we generally use the Kelpie and the um, Border Collie, but our Border Collie has been specifically bred to have a shorter coat, so her hair will look similar to Flirt's in length instead of that nice long, fluffy black and white ones. Mm. So we do have one; she's here as well. Um, I didn't think I could handle both of them at the same fair, time. Fair so enough. I just took this one. But yeah, we generally just use the Kelpie and the Border Collie here in oh Australia. My God. Why is the length? Why did you mention the length of the fur, though? So because where all our sheep farms are, it's very hot. Um, if you have the big collies with their long coat, they overheat very quickly. So right. it's not okay. Fair on them. It's not fair on us. It just yeah it doesn't really work. So we need the short coat. Oh hi. So how many sheep is she responsible for? So here at Lone Pine, we have 20 sheep at a time that we rotate through every couple of months so that they don't learn the course because sheep aren't that silly. But Flirt came off a property that she was working over 200 sheep on her own very easily. So they're very capable of doing a large amount of sheep with no issues at all. It's just amazing watching a sheep. Dog. So why is, why is Flirt here though? I mean, you said she was working 200 sheep and now she's here in the sanctuary. Is there a reason for her being here? So both the dogs are here because we've been doing the sheepdog show. So it's oh, right. just basically to let people that live in the city that never have an opportunity to see how it's actually done out there in the big country. Did Flirt get hired then? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Does she have working hours? 
She does. She, we do two shows a day, so they'll take it in turns with our two dogs. So we usually alternate. Flirt usually does our first morning show, which is at 11 o'clock, and then Lucy will do the second one. But we have the two just in case anything does happen or if Flirt's mucking up and she needs more practice on the sheet, we can do two shows with her and vice versa with Lucy. She looks fast. Oh, yeah. <laughs> do you want to hold it? So we might need you to use that yeah, microphone, yeah. actually, if that's okay. Actually take it out and hold it. So Whichever's that, easier. Yeah, just be careful of the mic. Is it easier for you to hold on to the mic or just leave it on stand? It's You're okay. It's yeah. not on? Oh, no volume. No, no, okay. okay. Hi, try again. On Is that better? Yeah. Oh, Amazing. sweet. Okay. Thank you. Hi, hi. Where are you going? Oh. Hello. So what, what breed is... Uh, so She's a, a Kelpie. Kelpie. Yeah. Yes. This is the first yeah. time I'm hearing uh, uh, of that breed. Kelpie. Is it an Australian dog? It is. It yes. is, okay. So it is a specific Australian breed. Um, you can definitely get them overseas. They're quite typically, they have that red coat. I don't oh, know yeah. if you've seen Red Dog. It's an Australian movie. But yeah, they use the Kelpie. And they're very typical to have that nice red coat. But they also do come in this lovely black and tan. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so sweet. <laughs> yeah, she really lives up to her name of Flirt. <laughs> <laughs> I see where she gets the name yeah, now. Yeah, yeah, she came to so us with friendly. the name and we were like, oh, really? who, who calls a dog Flirt? And then it didn't take us very long. but <laughs> To figure out yeah, why. Yeah, exactly why she was she's a real that. people person, oh, isn't yeah, she? She loves affection. And oh. I'm, I'm guessing because she looks very fit, so she does a lot yes. of work. Yes, so she's, she's very lean. We try to keep them. We weigh them every month. So Flirt's usually around the 16 to 18 kilos, and we try and monitor that very carefully to make sure that she doesn't exceed that. Because if she's too big, you know, she can get joint problems and all of that yeah. kind of mm -hmm. stuff. But yeah, so they're very, very lean. She's hit a top speed of 67 Ks. Wow. Oh. Wow. Yeah, pretty nuts. What's her, what's her diet like? So here she gets a special um, active dog food biscuit. Um, they get fed twice a day, mm. but it's lunch and dinner. Mm. Because if we fed them breakfast, if they eat and then do all of that we'll work. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. So yeah. we have to feed them just lunch and dinner. Is there, is there a retirement age for sheep dogs? There is. It is kind of on the dog as well, like their overall health. Um, but around the 8 to 10 years is when you'd usually retire your dog. But even when they're old, so the two dogs that used to work here, they retired and went home with one of the keepers. And she'd still bring him in and he'd still try and work. But because of his age, he just couldn't quite keep up. But yeah, yeah. the drive never goes away. They constantly want to be working on sheep. Wow. Right. You sure you're not Singaporean now, blood? <laughs> 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 want to work until past retirement. Now, Singaporeans, if you're thinking, you know, you want to get a Kelpie or whatever, okay, make sure you're able to dedicate enough time to take it out. For the for energy, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. absolutely. Yeah. They don't make a suitable pet. Yeah. Um, yeah. They're not apartment dogs. Time. No, okay. definitely not. Red card is up. All right. <laughs> okay. Okay. Don't send me off. <laughs> <laughs> we're just going to go on air now. So just okay. We were on Facebook. Ah, uh, okay. Sweet. Kiss night to all the great songs in one place. Uh, welcome to The Big Show and The Big Show TV. That was Glass Animals with Heat Waves. We spoke to Ranger Maddie earlier on, and now we have our second guest. And uh, he is actually Kelp. Uh, the, the dog that you see <laughs> you know, on screen right now is a Kelpie. That's the breed. Uh, her name is Flirt. And her handler right here is Aeon. Good morning, Aeon. Good morning. Aeon. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, tell us a little bit more about uh, Flirt, Aeon. So Flirt here is our Kelpie. Um, she's been working here for about eight years. Uh, she came to us. She came to us when she was two, uh, fully trained, and then we just keep on working with her training. So her job here is to basically round up our sheep that we have on site and put them through the obstacles. Alrighty, Daddy, you got a little bit of a technical problem there, but you see how wonderful these dogs are. And, you know, I was, I was just wondering how can it, it's incredible to have a dog like a Kelpie that's been clocked at 67 kilometers an hour. That is just something that is, to me, unbelievable. A 67 kilometer an hour dog. But as you can see, Lone Pine is really quite an incredible place uh, as a sanctuary and as a place to visit if you're ever going to Queensland. It's... Um, 
I've, I've always believed that places like this are the sort of places, especially if you're traveling with children, uh, they should get a chance to see places like Lone Pine. And I'm so glad that Queensland has places like this because uh, in Singapore, we don't get enough opportunities. I think now with the new zoo we have here, it's getting better. Uh, but a lot of kids, again, don't have uh, the opportunity of seeing uh, uh, animals like this uh, in their more natural habitats. Thank you for that, FD. Thank you Thank so you. much. Thank you. We do apologize for that uh, slight technical glitch, but we are back coming to you live from Lone Pine Koala Sanctuary. It's Glenn, Angel, and Daphne with Aeon right now and, and Flirt. flirt. <laughs> so Flirt, uh, I was going to call you Flirt. You're not that much of a Flirt. She's, she's more flirtatious, I'm sure. Uh, so Aeon, tell us uh, why it's important for, for people to come here to Lone Pine Koala Sanctuary and watch a show like what Flirt does, uh, rounding up the sheepdog and all that. So I think, uh, I think it's really important because it lets people that don't have the opportunity to actually go out to a sheep station and see what the work is there. It is very small scale here, but it's really nice that people can have accessibility to it that they normally wouldn't be able to see what goes on when we're getting all those sheep in. It's an immense job. Um, here doesn't really do it enough justice, really. Mm. Like they'll be working multiple dogs on over 2,000 sheep kind of thing at a time. Wow. And the amount of work that these dogs do is just incredible. Like I can basically stand out there just in the one spot mm. and then give my hand directions and cues to flirt and she will just do everything. Oh, it's, wow. it's incredible the work wow. they do. So she can do the work of about five people. So <gasps> they definitely are worth their weight in gold. Wow. Is and this a, yeah. And she's very fit, so you can see Ooh, that yeah. she, she does the work. <laughs> oh, definitely. So she's hit a top speed of 67 Ks. So wow. who trained her, Eon? So she came trained from a station in New South Wales. I believe it was Orange. I'm not too sure who the person was that trained her. Um, but yeah, she came trained. But then because she was working on such a large amount of sheep, we kind of had to shape it and mold mm. it to suit what we do here. So we did have to do quite a bit of training and keep on doing training with her. She does like to push the boundaries at times. And <laughs> yeah. Yeah. She looks like she's ready to go and oh, jump yeah. off your lap. For those of you who are not tuned into the Big Show TV early on, um, Flirt over here uh, used to work with over 200 sheep. Wow, that's, that's, a, that's crazy. Uh, what, is a, what is the lifespan of a typical working dog like this? So a typical working dog like this, it's around the 10 to 15. Um, because they are so fit and active, it can go quite a bit longer. So I'm pretty sure that the longest living one was a working dog and it was over 20 years old. <gasps> so they do have an incredible lifespan if they keep nice and fit and active. But yeah. they don't work all that Definitely time. not. Yeah. So the working span of it would be around the eight to ten years, and that's when you would retire them. There and you, you were saying before, they still have the drive to work even after that. Definitely. So Flirt here will be wanting to work right up until she hits the grave. She definitely Aww. just wants to work, work, work. She Aww. has an incredible drive. Just like humans, I mean, diet and exercise. Yes, definitely. Most sure. important things. For sure. Lots of activity. Don't and overfeed your dogs. Yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and is there a special skill that uh, got Flirt recruited to be a sheepdog or was she just born into a sheepdog so family? She was just born into a sheepdog family. They do need that drive. So mm. definitely some dogs are better suited than others. Um, not all Kelpies have the drive. So not all Kelpies will want to actually work on sheep. Um, but yeah, Flirt had the drive. She's also very friendly, which we need in this kind of situation to see everyone. So sometimes they can be quite one handler. I don't want to talk to any other person. So we're very lucky that <laughs> Flirt has lived up to her name and is very flirtatious. She just loves tried everyone. She yeah. just tried yeah. to kiss yeah, she me. Loves yeah, yes, yes. You're, you're quite flirtatious. <laughs> I know, yeah. I'm a, <laughs> only when it comes to Flirt. <laughs> <laughs> and also our next dogs. guest. Yeah, all, all animals. <laughs> so, I so for the benefit of people who are tuning in right now, I mean, we hear the term sheepdog all the time, but what is the definition of a sheepdog? So definition of a sheepdog would be a dog that can work on our sheep. So basically, they're an extension of us when we're out there. They do most of the work. We just give them cues and directional um, help here and there. But mainly the dog will go out there, get those sheep, and then always bring them back towards you, which mm. is what we need. When you're on those big properties, it's sometimes you can't even see the dog, and right. you still have to send her off. So she's a Kelpie, but what are some of the more common... Okay, what are some of the more common uh, breeds of dog uh, 
uh, that become sheepdogs? So here in Australia, we use the Kelpie and we use the Border Collie. Uh, the Border Collies are specifically bred short-haired working breed here in Australia. They're the two typical ones that we use here. But you've got your lassies, you've got the long-haired collies. There's also the Australian, um, what was it? The Australian sheepdog. It's mm. uh, sorry, not the Australian sheepdog. But I've heard that as well. So yeah, it's, home, it's, the it's, the Ameri it's, they it's an it American the breed, though. Oh, the yeah. Aussie Shepherd, sorry. The no, Aussie oh, Shepherd, okay. okay. Yeah, so it's an but American they're American. Breed. <laughs> yeah, I know. Well, 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 yeah. I don't understand it either, but they're an American breed. They have the long coat, which is why they don't really get used here. Oh, yeah. right, okay. I just okay. thought it was important to explain that of because course. many people think right. sheepdog, it's a breed. Lassie. Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah of course. You know what I mean? And they're going like, hey, Flynn doesn't look like a sheepdog. But she but works like breeds. a sheepdog. Yeah. So yes. beautiful. Well, thank you very much, Aeon, so much, Aeon, for joining us. Thank you very much for having me. Thank, thank you, Flirt. Thank you, Flirt. Good girl. <laughs> Good girl. We've been speaking to uh, Aeon, uh, who is uh, Flirt's handler right here at uh, Lone Pine Koala Sanctuary. Uh, coming up next, uh, we've got... Ooh. <laughs> Daphne's favorite. Daphne's favorite. <laughs> we'll be meeting a, a lizard. And a snake. No, I think it's a just snake. a snake. Oh, yeah? There oh, it is. My heart oh, is going. Look oh, wow. At... That's amazing. Come Flat, on over come and back. come sit here. <laughs> Flat, come and come sit back. here. <laughs> good day, good day. Good day. This is your microphone. You are Cameron. Yep. And who is this you've got with you? Um, so, this is Niobe. Um, and Niobe is our black headed python. So Am I allowed to our, touch it? Yeah, for sure. If you just pop your hand out flat. <laughs> So Niobe is our black-headed python. She's a native species here in Australia. Um, and she's a very, very unique snake. So what these guys do is they live out in sort of the more arid areas in the top end of Australia. Um, and they'll use their head as a solar panel. So these guys are cold-blooded. They need the sun to heat up. Um, so in the morning, she'll sort of live under a rock or under a log. Um, and she'll poke that little black head of hers out. And that gets her nice and warm for the day. So oh. she is very, very cool. And what's their diet? Beautiful. Um, so they are reptile eaters. So she'll eat oh, okay. yep, pretty much every reptile she can find. Um, and she even eats venomous snakes and she'll be completely okay. So she's got no venom. She is a constrictor. Okay. Um, but what she can do is she can get bitten by a venomous snake and be completely fine. Oh, wow. So okay. that's just because they've evolved to, um, to have that diet. So they've sort of got a protein in their blood that helps resist the venom. Well, they mm. eat like a five foot, no inches Asian girl. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, we're way too Asian big to be. <laughs> I'm joking. We're way too oh big to be God. on the menu. Um, so so they constrict. Yep, they okay. are constrictors. But they're not known as boa constrictors. This is a python, no, right? No, so this she is a python. python. She's python. not a boa constrictor. Does um, she have fangs? No, so fangs are only for venomous snakes. They're what inject the venom. Um, but she does have plenty of teeth. She's got about 40 or 50 teeth in there. Um, and that's and they purely are, for eating her yeah, prey. Yeah, purely for grabbing onto things. So if it does sort of try but to she doesn't bite. No, she's very well behaved. She's quite lovely. And so, who are their predators? Um, so when they're little, pretty much everything that eats mm. meat will eat them. Um, and even at this size, another black-headed <laughs> python that was bigger than her would come and sort of have a bit of a snack on her. Um, but when she gets sort of this size, it's not too, too much. So large monitors um, and sort of cats and dogs as oh, well. Oh, wow. Okay. Yeah. Mm. So where's the best place to, to pet a snake? Um, so on, obviously not on her head. So just like people, there she doesn't go. like being cut mm. on the face. Right. Um, but anywhere else. Just so like on a, yeah. <laughs> Stop yeah, it. I don't know. I'm not a big fan of people getting into my personal space. Yeah, for but sure. Apart from here, that, she's pretty here. good on the back on her tail. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, anywhere really. She's trying to get down onto the table. Yeah, I thought that was quite, a very important question because, uh, yeah. you know, Angel would have just touched her on the face. Oh, okay. Right. Uh, Which I did not, but yeah. okay. <laughs> Stand by. Kiss night to all the great songs in one place. It's Glenn Angel and Daphne coming to you live from Lone Pine Koala Sanctuary. And we are here with Cameron right now, who has... What's uh, the snake's name again? Um, her name is Niobe. 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 Yep. And she is our black-headed python, so she's a native species here in Australia. How old is Niobe? Um, so Niobe's 17. 
Wow. Um, yeah, wow. so she's about middle-aged. These guys can get up to about 30 or 35 years old. Oh, wow. Um, so, yeah, she's still got quite a while of a nice long life to live. Okay. And uh, you, uh, you need to watch us on The Big Show TV if you're listening to us on the radio. You can uh, tune in on Facebook and YouTube. Uh, what's the hab- What's Naomi's habit- uh, Naomi's habitat? Um, so you find these guys from about Rockhampton all the way through the top end of Australia. So that's about 10 hours drive north of Lone Pine. Um, and they're sort of in the more arid, dry areas is where you get them. Um, and that's sort of all the way through the top end of Australia. It's so like a, very sandy. Yeah, quite a big range mm. um, for these guys. They're not really a rainforest species or anything mm. like that. And uh, do they eat people? No, <laughs> no, 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 no. Important just, question. Just asking. Just asking. O- only small people. Oh. <laughs> no, you don't we're, like being con. <laughs> <laughs> we're definitely not on the menu for these guys. We are way too big. Um, but her favorite food in the wild is other reptiles. Okay. So these guys so like can, lizards and... Yep, lizards, geckos, frogs, and even other snakes. Um, and I think the coolest fact about these guys is they can be bitten by a venomous snake and be completely fine. Oh, wow. wow. Yeah. They've so, got like some kind of immunity. Yeah. So they've got in. a special like protein in their blood um, and that helps them sort of withstand any of the effects. So what would be a predator to Naomi? Um, so other black-headed pythons would eat they do sort of cannibalize, um, oh. but sort of a bit of everything. So if they're nice and little cats, dogs, birds of prey, everything will eat small snakes. Um, but once she gets up to about this size, it's normally things like feral cats and, um, and dingoes. And even your large monitors will have a go. Yeah, is she fully grown? Yeah, she's about fully grown. These guys get up to about two meters or so. Um, and then they sort of slow right down once they get past about a meter and a half. Yeah. And how often do they eat? Um, she eats every two weeks. Two here weeks? Here at Lone okay. Pine. Mm. Um, and she won't eat over winter time either. Because um, oh. these guys are cold blooded. Um, what they'll do is they'll sort of slow right down over winter, not quite hibernating, mm. um, but they'll do what's called brumation. So they slow down, they stop eating. And then once it warms back up in spring, they'll get back onto the food. So they're sunny weather people then. Yeah, yeah. Brumation. People, I call it people. Brumation. Brumation. It's a very sunny yeah, that's, that's the kind of lifestyle I'd like. Yeah. <laughs> Just pop up <laughs> when it's a bit warm. Yeah. yeah. And how often does she shed her skin? Um, about every eight weeks for her. Oh, wow. Okay. Um, yeah, so it's not too, sort of not too often. Mm. Um, but when they're younger, they can shed about every month. And when, so? they're, when they're small, how, how big are they when they're born? Um, when they hatch, they're only about 20 centimetres long. They're quite oh. small. Um, and then, yeah, they'll grow quite a lot bigger over their lifetime. All right. Uh, we're speaking to Cameron, and he, he's uh, showing us uh, <laughs> Naobi. 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 Yeah. Um, and Naobi is a python. Yeah. A black-headed, a black-headed headed python. A black-headed <laughs> python. All right. Keep it right here on KISS 92. It's Glenn, Angel, and Daphne coming to you live from Brisbane. So Cameron okay. is the black-headed python uh, indigenous to Australia? Yep, yep. So they're okay. found nowhere else. They are only found in Australia. And I reckon they're probably one of our most stunning python species. Can I? Like all Can over I Australia? Here we are. Um, no, so only sort of the top end of Australia. Um, so we're just going to put her on your shoulders there. And if you just keep your hands out flat, she'll cruise around. Um, yeah, they're sort of found through the top end of Australia. Cruising around, all right. <laughs> and what what yeah. is she threatened by? Um, so feral cats are one of our big problems here in Australia. I don't know if you guys have heard that much today. No, um, not really about feral cats. Yeah, unfortunately, feral cats are quite a big problem for our native reptiles. They are. Um, she <laughs> oh, she's, she's going, going through your chair. chair. <laughs> yeah. Here we are. I'll give you a hand. Okay, I'll stand up. Just stay still for a second. She won't be able to go through all the way, no? No, she's a little bit too fat, but she tries to get in. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think it'd be um, good if you stand up. Okay. Yeah, she does try to get into everything she can. I'll bring her up off your waist there. <laughs> um, but yeah, cats are a big problem for our native wildlife, especially our reptiles. But other things for her that are a threat are sort of birds of prey and normal natural predators too. We're supposed to rap, but Angel just doesn't it's want to. Yet leave. another yeah, fashion yeah, accessory. Fashion fashion. No, no, not a fashion accessory. Never. A live one. A pet, a pet. Wait, do no, people keep black-headed pythons as pets? Yep, yeah, you can keep you them can? as pets okay. in Australia. Um, we can only keep native reptiles um, on certain licenses, okay. so they are kept as pets. But you need a license. Yeah, you need them. a license, and there's a few requirements and the, for and these it's guys. Pretty, yeah, it's good because it'll kill the venomous snakes around. Uh, <laughs> Um, no, they're not endangered. They are fairly common um, throughout their range. Mm, yeah. But unfortunately, yeah, there are a few things that are threatening them. Just like I said, feral cats. Angel thinks she's Britney Spears. <laughs> 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 so, did 
This is the head. Does it stop where the black stops then? I get that question all the time and I always forget what my answer is. Um, so her head normally stops there and then when you ask where the neck stops and ends, I have no idea. You have no idea, okay. <laughs> because you were saying earlier, if you're going to touch a snake, it's on its back. Yeah. Here. Yeah, so sort of we try to aim from about here where your left hand is all the way back through. Is so there a direction? Um, normally just, just yeah, back down. down, right? Yep. Yeah. And the python does not have fangs. This because as Cameron particular. said earlier, only venomous snakes have fangs. But it has teeth. It has teeth. Yeah. It has teeth. And if it bites you, will it hurt? Um, it's not too bad. It's just like getting a tattoo or getting a few needles. Um, they are sort of needle sharp little teeth. So it's mm. sort of, it's a bit of a shock more than anything. Um, and how do they find, how do they find their way around? Is it, is, is it through sight? Is it through sound, vibrations? What is it? A um, bit of everything. So they use their tongue a lot for sort of smelling the air, seeing what's around. Okay, um, so and then they will use their eyesight again. as well. Oh, there we go. We'll okay. bring it back up. Yep. Um, but their eyesight's very movement focused as well. So if you stand still in front of a snake, they'll just keep cruising past. If you wave your arms, you stomp your feet, they're going to get a little bit more scared. Good to know. Yeah. <laughs> so if you do see a snake while you're here, um, definitely just stand still and let it cruise on past. Okay. Okay. I, I don't think I'll be able to do Daphne. anything else. <laughs> Come on, Daphne. No, 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 no. Just say hello. Come on. Daphne Koo. <laughs> Running away. No, please, no. But she's so pretty. I'm so, so close. <laughs> How much time do we have? I, I, I want to... No? Oh, you want to hold it? We, we have time? Can you Alrighty, yeah, I'll just yeah, jump up the mic yeah. yeah, I will hold it. Just put it around. Yeah. Oh, no. no. Just like this. No. This is it. What is your your hands hands out and to do it's so smooth. I, it's, it's, not, it's not about how smooth it is. Have you never touched a snake? Just touch and then at least you can say you've touched it. I, okay, I have touched a snake. That nonsense, you have not. <laughs> you just said no. <laughs> She's beautiful, oh, isn't she? Yeah. I mean, yes, she is beautiful. Oh, gorgeous, Just one stroke. One please small don't, stroke. Don't no, no, no. Stop, stop pushing me, Katie. <laughs> She's beautiful, oh, huh? Let me say. How old did you say she was? Um, seven, seven, Seventeen. Seven, yeah. Seventeen. And how many eggs do they lay at one go? Um, so depending on the species, they can lay up to about fifteen. Sorry, depending on the species, they lay up to about fifteen or sixteen. Um, so, yeah, for her, that's sort of average. Okay. And there are some snakes that have live babies as well. Some snakes have live babies? Yeah. yeah. So, Th that would not make them a reptile? No, so they are still reptiles. They don't have milk, so milk's what makes us mammals. Oh, right, but, okay. yeah, they will um, produce live young over having eggs. I had no um, idea. But it's sort of like having an egg inside and then it comes out. So what, it, the egg kind of cracks inside and they are still More having... More or less, Right, yeah, okay, got it. a bit of a different it. development. Oh, got it, got it, got it. Okay. So, Okay, Are we? Yeah, Cameron. You. Thank you no so worries, much, thank Cameron. You thank you, Naomi. Yeah. Thank you. Well, no worries, thank you. Thank you so much, Cameron. Right, that was epic. Really thank you. Very scared. Yes. <laughs> oh, look at the dingo. <gasps> okay, our next guests. <laughs> will be the dingoes. Uh, I believe Beck is here with the dingoes. Who's Beck? Ma Mai and Beck. Hello. And who are, come on, come on and sit down. So we've got uh, Beck and Mai who have Sterling and, is Jody? it Jerdy? Jindy. Jindy. Jindy or Jerdy? Jindy. Hi. Who, like who is this one? This is our Jindy. beautiful boy, Sterling. This is Sterling. Okay. Yes. Hi, Hi Sterling. Can I, can I Absolutely. Oh, maybe not on the table, mate. Okay. <laughs> I've got oh. precious equipment there. No, that's fine. It's just my Hi, iPad. Jindy. It's okay. Hi. Hi, Sterling. Hi. Yeah, so Sterling is our young boy, and Jindy behind you is our young girl. They are both four and a half years old. Are they siblings? Baby. They are not, but they're the exact same age. They share a birthday. Their litters were born on the exact same oh, day. Oh, wow. Uh, and they've known each other from about five weeks of age. So uh, they've, they've grown up together. They're as, as close as they can be without actually being related. And they do. Oh, oh. <laughs> okay, that's all right. That's they okay. do get that's along fine. very well. That's wow. Fine. And how long have you been a, a, a keeper here at Lone Pine? Uh, at the end of the month, it will be 20 years. Okay, Amazing. Angel, we're going back on air. Okay, let's go on air. Okay. Don't worry about the chair, but just the mic. Hi, Sterling. Hello. 
Thank you. Okay. Jindy is shy. Stand by. Charlie Puth featuring John Cook. That's left and right, right here on Kiss 92. All the great songs in one place. It's Glenn Angel and Daphne coming to you live from Lone Pine Koala Sanctuary. It's time to bring on the dingoes. <laughs> we have Keeper Beck with Sterling and Keeper Mai with Jindy. A very good morning to you, so Beck. Cute. Good morning. Very Thank nice you for to meet you all. Us. Tell us a little bit more about dingoes, uh, Beck, because I think they have a little bit of a uh, tough reputation, uh, especially with, I, I remember some decades ago with, uh, with one of the dingoes taking a baby, a movie was made out of it, and tell that's, us a little bit more. That's correct. So our dingoes, unfortunately, do have a very mixed reputation here in Australia. They are our largest land predator here in Australia, just found on the mainland. We don't have any dingoes in Tasmania. Uh, because they are a large predator, they can be a threat to livestock. So uh, sheep and cattle, for example. So not all of our farmers are a big fan. And there are some places around Australia where they have gotten very used to people being around. So naturally, dingoes are actually a cautious and shy species, very wary uh, of things that they're not used to, which in most places around Australia is humans, because in your more remote areas and out in the deserts and things like that, there aren't all that many people coming close to our wild dingoes. Mm. Right. But on some of our camping spots, uh, like in the Northern Territory, where the Chamberlain case was back in the 80s, and also currently on Gari, formerly known as Fraser Island off the coast of Queensland, the dingoes do get very used to people being around, sometimes having food on them, and they lose their natural shyness, become a lot more bold, mm. getting closer to people, which is not ideal for a wild animal, and that is when you can then have incidents occurring. I so see. pretty much it's just really important that everybody respects the dingo as a wild canid, yeah. a wild animal, a bit more like a wolf than like our domestic dogs right. uh, and by simply not encouraging them to get close to us and listening to instructions that rangers etc are giving out everyone's going to stay safe that's mm. good advice that's mm. absolutely fantastic advice now are dingoes um, hard to train? Because they've obviously been trained, um, you they know, have, Sterling and, and Jindy. They've joined you here on their collars and leads as part of their daily walk out and about in the sanctuary. They can be relatively easy to train uh, in a fairly similar way to we do it with our domestic dogs. It certainly helps if they are food focused and they nice. like their food rewards. That is the best reinforcement we could give. Uh, and so I'm currently wearing uh, a treat pouch with some chicken mints on me at the moment so I can reward them for their good behaviour when they're out and about. And part of their obedience training we did as they arrived here as young pups included uh, their recall to come to us when called as well as having good manners on the lead and doing sit, shake and drop as a few examples of the oh. commands they can do. Oh, wow. I and need to teach my tofu that. <laughs> sit, shake and drop. <laughs> are dingoes, um, are they endangered at all? They are... It's tricky because, once again, part of their mixed reputation, they are managed differently in each state and territory of Australia. So they can range from being a protected species to a threatened species to the other extreme, an invasive pest species. Oh, right. oh. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So here in Queensland, for example, they are protected if they're in national parks, but outside of national parks, they're considered an invasive pest species mm. and property owners and farmers are actually expected to control numbers of dingoes on their properties. So oh, what do wow. they do then? They can uh, shoot them or uh, sometimes bait them, which is tricky uh, as well because that can affect non-target animals. And even when uh, Australians like the, the government and that are doing wild dog baiting programs, the dingoes do get caught within that as well. We are speaking to Keeper Beck, who has with her Sterling, her dingo, and uh, well, Keeper Mai is here with Jindy. We'll continue to talk to Beck on the Big Show TV. Meantime, here's Britney Spears with Toxic on KISS 92. Okay. Amazing. We'll keep going. Yeah. We're yeah. on. We're yeah. on the video we're still now. Alive. No <laughs> problem. So, so you you mentioned wild canard. Did you say? Is a that wild what they canid is what they consider. So okay. the the Canidae family includes dingoes, domestic dogs, foxes, wolves, jackals, coyotes, okay. etc. Uh, so. Uh, a distinction between dingoes and our domestic dogs is that dingoes can be tamed 
but not domesticated. So the two dingoes that are with you here today mm. are great examples of tame dingoes that are very comfortable and confident around people and in areas where there are lots of activities and things going on. They're really comfortable with, with my and I, the keepers who are handling them especially. Uh, but wild dingoes and even our tame dingoes here are still inherently a wild canid, so quite different to our domestic right. dogs. But they're such lucky dingoes to be in your care. I thank you very much. I believe <laughs> that too. These guys have got a pretty good life and they soon end up being a favourite amongst keepers, volunteers and visitors alike here at Lone Pine. They've got mm. great personalities, individual personalities and the fact that they are so tame means that we can get really close to them and have some really nice encounters and interactions. Right. And can they be kept as like pets? They can. Once again, that depends on the state of Australia that you live in because oh, okay. different laws in different states. Here in Queensland, they're not allowed to be kept as pets, whereas over the border in New South Wales, they can be kept as a pet, just like any other dog breed. And another example, in the state of Victoria, you can keep them as a pet if you have a special permit. Right. Okay. Okay. So cute. And it's hard so to handsome. like see them as wild because they are so cute looking. Like They really look like domestic dogs and you could make that... You know, mistake, mistake by thinking yeah. that yeah absolutely and we quite often when we're doing our daily walks around the sanctuary we have people asking if they're the sheep dogs <laughs> or if they're security dogs walking around uh and they certainly do visually look a lot like our domestic dog breeds but there are several differences between dingoes and domestic dogs so i mentioned initially the fact that yep. these guys are wild <laughs> um, and so they're genetically different as well a completely different breed in regards to vocalizations, dingoes don't bark like our dogs do. Oh, so yeah. that's yeah. something that people do find really interesting. They mainly howl to communicate ah. to their to their pack. So they're quite similar to the wolf in a few different ways, with the howling, with being a wild canid, and also the fact that they do live in packs. For mm. dingoes, their packs aren't generally as big as wolf packs. They're mainly made up of small family groups. So right. they have leaders. They do, yes. Mm. And it's generally there's an alpha pair, male mm. and female. Uh, that are the only ones that do the breeding. And another thing that distinguishes dingoes from our domestic dogs, they can only have one litter of pups per year during their set breeding season. Our pet dogs can have litters up to twice a year. Mm. And it's both the mum and dad dingo which helps to raise those dingoes in the um, in the litter. So yeah. big group wow. effort. Okay. I love it. We've been educated yes, yeah. about absolutely. dingoes. And, and Look, that's the kind of work. How much time have you got? Lone there is so much information. <laughs> I'm <but> sure. <laughs> I'm sure. Kudos to Lone Pine Koala Sanctuary. Do, do they ever, I mean, when it comes to breeding, do they ever crossbreed in the wild? They can, yes. Okay. So uh, hybrids of dingoes and dogs are possible. Mm. And they can sometimes be a little bit more problematic because they've got the combination of the predatory instincts and abilities of the dingoes yeah. plus the confidence that our pet dogs have in being around people. Yeah. So that can sometimes make them a little bit more brave and confident on farm property edges and things like that. So they can sometimes do more damage to livestock. It's a bit dangerous, livestock. yeah. Yeah. They're good. So do you only have the two here? We have three. Okay. So uh, we've got our, an older dingo called Tanami, who is our pack leader. She is currently 13 years old and she has also lived here at Lone Pine since she was a young puppy. And is that, how, how long do they live? In human care, 12 to 14 years is an average. Okay. I do keep on reminding Tanami they can go beyond the average and there are some 18-year-old dingoes that I know of living at the sanctuary where Sterling was born, actually. Oh, wow. Yeah. Fantastic. The dingoes living in the wild, their lifespan's that little bit shorter. It's about seven to ten years. I see. Okay. Well, thank you very much, Beck, for joining us today thank you, and Beck. telling us all about dingoes. My pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Beck. Thank you, Mai. Thank you, Mai. Thank you so much. Thank, thank, thank you, you Sterling. Thank you, Jindy. All right. So Once again, we are coming to you live from Lone Pine Koala Sanctuary, um, which is an 18-hectare koala sanctuary in Brisbane suburb uh, Fig Tree Pocket. It was founded in 1927, and uh, you know it is the first, oldest, and largest koala sanctuary of its kind in the world. Yeah. I mean, if you ever find yourself in Brisbane City, it's only a 20-minute drive out, so this is definitely a great day out for the entire family. You get educated about all the koalas, the dingoes, the, the, the snakes, the reptiles, and, and lots of other animals. And speaking of which, she's going to tell us more. Uh, we have our next guest, uh, a sales manager from Lone Pine Koala Sanctuary, Amy. Good morning. Hi. Good Hi, morning. Hi, Amy. Thanks so for exciting the to have you on the show. So excited to be here. We're Thank just you walking for around just today. now, and now yeah. you're on the show. Yeah. Now I'm here. Yeah. You get to come Super. here every single day, huh? I, it's 
the best place to work. How could you not love it? I know I how long you. Amy's been working here at Lone Pine Koala Sanctuary. Tell us. 12 years. 12 yeah. years. Wow. And, yeah. and you said it's such a great place to work that you can't even tell your two and a half year old daughter that you're coming here <laughs> every day because she'd want to tag along. She would, yeah. yeah. At the moment, oh I can be like, I'm going to work. And she's like, yeah, okay, bye. Like <laughs> if she knew this is where I worked, it would be all over. Oh, How, my goodness. And has she come here many times already? She has, yeah, yeah. She's been here a few times. She loves the kangaroos. They're oh, definitely her favorite. Wow. Yeah. So tell us a little bit more about uh, how many animals you have, how many types of animals you have here. Yeah, so we have around 75 species of native Australian animals, um, which is about 400 individual animals that we take care of every single day. So okay. Just wow. a few, yeah. <laughs> That's quite a bit. And do you, every day do you focus on, do you look at all of them or do you find a kind of focus on different ones per day of the week? Or Yeah, so um, all the animals are cared for each day. So they've all got designated keepers, which you've right, met of some of them this morning. Yeah, yeah. And then um, from our team, so I look after um, marketing and sales, we kind of look what's going on um like september is save the koala month so obviously that's a really big month for our koalas um there's other months with different focuses and conservation efforts that we're looking after so on, a, on a daily basis how many people visit the sanctuary mm. oh on average? Um, it really varies um outside of school holidays we probably have about a thousand people a day but during our peak periods it'd be over two thousand um, wow coming that's through amazing. our doors yeah you, I, I'm sure you have a favorite. I know it's like it's like it's oh, like it's picking a, a favorite one. child, yeah. right? But <laughs> but what is your favorite experience here within Lone Pine? Oh, um, it'd be a toss up between the dingo encounter. So you can actually go into our dingo exhibit, the ones you just met, um, and spend time with them in their space, which is really really cool. But I also love our free flight raptor show. So that's on twice a day where we free fly our birds of prey. So our owls, our eagles, hawks, falcons. I've been to that show hundreds of times and it's different every time. It's amazing. Raptor. Wow. Raptors. prehistoric. Yeah. Our raptor keepers have the coolest title in the world. <laughs> <laughs> raptor keepers. <laughs> so if someone was coming here to Lone Pine for the very first time, how long would it take them to experience everything within the sanctuary? Um, We'd say about a half day. Okay. Yeah, yeah. And okay. you can do all of it in half a day, you reckon? Yeah. yeah, yeah. Okay. Half a day is a really nice time. So it's great for families, especially those with little kids, because it's not a massive day out for them. So, mm. Yeah. Mm. What's the best time of day to come? I personally love last thing in the afternoon. If you were here from like two o'clock onwards, it's quieter. Um, to be up in the kangaroo reserve where we have 150 free ranging kangaroos. 150? 150, wow. just a few. Um, when the just sun's starting to set, they're all coming out to eat the grass. It's oh. the best time of day. Magic. What's something not to miss? You know, because some, some, some yeah. people don't have half a day. You yeah. know, if they were to just come in and, they, and the, the really key areas in the sanctuary, what's not to miss? Yeah. Um, Definitely go and do the kangaroo feeding. That's really special to just sit down with those guys and hang out. <laughs> um, our platypus is also a really great exhibit. So we have two platypus here, Barrick and Aruna. Um, Barrick is actually the world's oldest captive platypus. How old he, is he? Oh, now you're testing me. World Did he just turn oldest? 25, oh, 23? Wow. In his 20s. He's in his 20s. He's well beyond his life expectancy. Um, what is their life expectancy? Um, in human care, about 18 years. Okay. So For he's well into his 20s. Yep. So he just got that title only a few weeks back, which is very, very exciting wow. for Barry. Yeah. Amazing. But we have, uh, well, some of the animals here who are even older than that. And I was blown away earlier on. We have uh, something in there that is s close to 70 years old, perhaps. Yeah. And we're so talking about the... Yeah, some the of cockatoo. our cockatoos. Mm. We've got three sulfur crested cockatoos here. Uh, Anthony, Caroline, and Mr. Cocky. They <laughs> came to Lone Pine well before I was here. So we believe they um, arrived here sometime in the 70s. Um, they came from an elderly lady who wasn't able to care for them anymore. So she surrendered them here to the sanctuary. Who knows how old they were when we got them. So... They'd be our oldest residents for sure. I mean, I'd say cockatoos are rampant in Australia because I remember going to uh, <laughs> Sydney. Every time I'm there in, the, in this particular area in Cogra, you would see them just flying around, sitting on the, sitting on the rooftops, on the trees. So yep. the, the, are they indigenous to Australia? They are, yes. Okay. Yep. So native to Australia and 
they do get around in massive flocks. Mm. Yeah, they're very noisy. They are very <laughs> noisy. We've the been ones hearing you, them. Yeah, the ones you had were very polite though. They said hello and yeah. they oh. said goodbye. <laughs> they have great manners. <laughs> yeah. We were just trying to teach them our Kiss 92 tagline as well. Yeah. <laughs> We'll have to stay there for, uh, for well, a, a few more. days yeah. and just uh, keep on repeating it. Yeah, how yeah. long does it take for them to to learn, um, to learn how to, to repeat yeah. a line? Oh, I'm not too sure. I guess it depends on the individual. Um, my parents also have a cockatoo. I think he's like 68 <gasps> or something. Um, but he'll pick up things within a few weeks or you know a month maybe if it's something he's hearing. So you've grown constantly. up with this cockatoo then? Yeah, yeah I Oh have. my gosh. Yeah. And he's, you can keep them as pets then? You can. Yes, yeah. Wow. Okay. Okay, we're going on air. G'day and welcome to The Big Show, live from Down Under. You'd be hopping mad to miss it. You come from an undown under. Once again, welcome back to The Big Show and The Big Show TV. Our third guest for this morning, we are currently at Lone Pine Koala Sanctuary. She is Amy Swin, the sales manager here. Good morning, Amy. Good morning. How are you? We're good. We're good. So for the benefit of the people who are listening to us right now and weren't watching us earlier on, now how long have you been here at Lone Pine and uh, what is your role? Yeah, so I've been here at the Sanctuary for 12 years um, and at the moment I am sales manager. So um, I look after all the inbound and international groups coming through the Sanctuary um, and as well as like our marketing and social media and that kind of thing. Well, you're Spreading doing a fantastic job. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but I'm sure you're an animal lover as well, which is I why am. you work here. Which yes. is why you work here. Yeah. Yep. Do you have any favorite uh, exhibits that are here in Lone Pine? Um, they're all great. The It'd be a tie for favorites between the dingoes um, that you just met. Those guys are something amazing. special. Mm -hmm. They're amazing. Um, but our free flight raptor show is also my favorite. Um, I've seen that show, I don't know how many times, hundreds. Uh, it's where we fly our owls, eagles, hawks and falcons and it's different every time. So definitely a highlight. Now, Singaporeans coming here to Lone Pine, uh, why do you think it's going to be so special for them? Um, well, the main thing about Lone Pine is that we are purely Australian native animals. So if you want to come and see those iconic species like your koalas and wombats and dingoes, kangaroos. Tasmania devils, kangaroos, they're all here. Um, but being a smaller sanctuary as well, it means that you can get up close and personal with our wildlife and have those really meaningful connections. Um, and we do believe that by connecting with wildlife, hopefully people go away feeling inspired to want to make a change and protect the wildlife in their home country as well. So. Why is it so important for people to to uh, to come to a sanctuary like this? Because there are a lot of people who are detractors of uh, sanctuaries, mm -hmm. zoos and stuff like that. But what is it that you're doing here that's so important? Yeah, so I think it's really important to visit zoos and sanctuaries to really understand the different species and the different threats and issues that they are facing out in the wild. Um, you can see things on social media or on the news and... And be like, oh, okay, like that kind of sucks. But I think when you actually come here and say meet a koala and have that connection with an individual who has a name and an age and a story and their own unique personality, you just connect on a deeper level. Um, and it's really important. Zoos and sanctuaries, a lot of them are also housing population, um, like insurance populations for certain species. So Tasmanian devils, for example, um, a lot of zoos and sanctuaries have really great breeding programs to breed healthy devils to then be released into the wild because they're not doing so well themselves. So without zoos and sanctuaries, a lot of species would have a very pretty dire future, unfortunately. Mm, now, Amy, amazing. what are some of your uh, memorable collaborations? Because you guys work with um, universities, organizations. Yep, yep. So our koala team in particular has been working with the team at QUT, so Queensland University of Technology for a number of years now, over 10 years, to develop a um, chlamydia vaccine for wild koala populations. So it's had obviously had been a lot of research, a lot of testing, trials. Um, it is now at the point where koalas have had a very positive response to this vaccine. So hopefully we can actually start trials out in wild koala populations to protect them from that disease. So that's 
Amazing. Massive milestone for everyone involved. All right. We've been speaking to Amy Swin, the sales manager here at Lone Pine Koala Sanctuary. Thank you so much, Amy. Thank you. For showing us around and, and being My so pleasure. kind to us today. Anytime. Thank you. All right. Up next, Olivia Rodrigo. This is Obsessed on KISS 92. Thank you. Thank, you. Thank you, Thank you, Amy. Thank you very much. We are still live on yeah, the Big Show TV. In just a while, we'll be showing you highlights of our dinner last night That's at right. Harvey's. Which is on James Street. I mean, it is an institution, right? And we did meet uh, PJ, who is the chef and the owner, uh, executive chef and owner of Harvey's. And they've been there, I think, if I'm not wrong, 17 years or something like that yeah. uh, on James Street. Yeah, he's um, been around. He's been. He's, he's been a legend, PJ. Years. He is uh, 18 a legend. years. 18 yeah. years, yeah. All so right. we're going to show the Shall pictures? Okay, now? let's okay. show the pictures. Let's walk it through. There we oh, are with the us. lovely ladies of Spree With Me, the ladies that took me on Imogene. that shopping. Imogene and Celia. And Celia. Yes. Look them up if you're looking for a personalized shopping experience. Oh, those oh. are the interior. The interior, the, interior. Mm -hmm. the bar. We didn't really try any cocktails, but we had some um, champagne. Prosecco. Yeah, two bottles of champagne. Oh, it oh, did no. not look like this when we were there. It was packed. <laughs> it was absolutely packed. It's hard to get a table. So if you are going, I highly recommend you res make a reservation. And yeah. they are open seven days a week, three meals a day. We Can were the first to arrive yesterday, we right? Yeah. But we by the time we left, the place was, was packed. packed. Every table was taken. Yeah. Next picture. Ooh, oh, this is my favorite. The scallops and, the scallops and gnocchi. gnocchi. Scallops and potatoes. And gnocchi. Yeah. Yeah. You could really so smell hearty. it the minute it was put down on the table. Yeah, no, it's so perfectly good. done. Perfectly oh, done. Oh, this was one of my favorites. The salmon? This story behind the salmon, uh, the cured salmon, is that they only used to do it at Christmas, mm -hmm. so seasonal, but then they just realized that people kept asking for it. Yeah. And so they brought it and they put it on the menu. No, PJ oh. was giving, a, giving it away for free. For Christmas, uh, yes. For Christmas. No, no, it was on the menu. Only no, and it, yeah, but he. Yeah, he they was gave it away, it away for, free. for free. He did give it he away did. for free. Yeah. He did. Yeah. And this is the uh, this is the goat cheese and tomato salad. Very very nice. I mean, obviously this was all mine. No was it eggplant? Uh, no, no, I don't know what that f that that vegetable is. Uh, no, it was not eggplant. Was not, huh? It was not. I, I didn't try this. Yeah, it was very yeah. fresh. Uh, olive oil and vinaigrette. Oh, this is the famous chicken, chicken salad. peanut salad. Yeah. It looks so good. Imogene from so Spree good. With Me was saying that this is what she has for lunch all the time. Yeah. Because she's always in the area. I mean, so it's a meal in itself. It is. Very hearty looking. Yeah. Yeah. Very generous portion too. Oh, this was my favorite. Yeah. Bar Barramundi. Barramundi. Um, the mashed potato and asparagus and that cream. Like a herb butter, was it? It was, yeah. I can't remember. Creme de... I can't remember. It's a French... French, yeah. uh, and French style. And French for style. people who don't like their food, like too creamy or what, let me assure you that oh, it was not... Not heavy? Yeah. Not, mm. I had two not plates. Heavy. <laughs> I had both plates. <laughs> <laughs> it was perfectly cooked. Oh, and uh, this, this, this was the vegetarian dish. The so pumpkin. <laughs> it had avocado. a roasted pumpkin, avocado. There was a broccolini with, uh, on a bed of kale and couscous with some nuts. And then you squeeze the lime over it. Everything mm, balanced mm, out really, mm, really well. Mm, mm. I polished this plate. I didn't off. try that. Yeah. The risotto? Oh, the risotto. Yes, this is the regular <laughs> prawn risotto. It's a. Uh well, slightly spicy, not that spicy, mm. but if you go down to PJ and his staff and you ask for a glenzotto, <laughs> then they will double the spice. For glenzotto, you. Okay. okay. Somebody's <laughs> going there right now and saying glenzotto. Yeah. Oh, it's another shot of the, the other cured salmon. Mm. Slightly different from the one earlier, or the same? Oh, and there, there we are. you go. That's PJ. That's PJ. PJ. Yep. And Who there plays we the are. guitar. <laughs> All right. Very well. Too. Okay, that's it. I mean, we are still here at Lone Pine. We're going to be moving on to uh, the Hinterlands, uh, to O'Reilly's right now. Uh, well, not right now, after the show. But this is it for the Big Show TV until tomorrow morning. Uh, we'll have lots more guests and you, well, lots more videos for you guys to watch. Yeah, absolutely. Let me show you the back of my shirt. Can you see? Oh, yes. <laughs> Before we go. Yeah, let's see the back of your shirt. It says, she'll be apples, which means everything will be okay. Since you're showing t-shirts, yeah, yeah. Okay. And let me make you uh, the sound uh, a koala makes. <laughs> that's, that's not what a koala sounds and like. And then, no? <laughs> my t-shirt. Oh, our t-shirt. Our t-shirts. Basically, if you find us, okay. please return us to Kiss92. No, please. don't. Just, just put them aside. <laughs> <laughs> T-shirts especially for you, you, Australia. Okay, we got to go. Uh, Thank you so much for watching. We'll see you all tomorrow. It's Glenn Angel and Daphne. 
in Australia. Good day.